everybody. Uh, welcome to Shop Talk with Jim and Ken, episode number 10. I'm Jim. And I'm Ken. Yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for joining us. A couple more topics to talk about. I'm going to cover a topic of fade margin setting in the radio. And what do you have for us today, Ken? Hi, Jim. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Today I was going to talk about the way that our license key structures are and how they show up in the store. To do this, I'm going to do a quick little screen share. So let me get that set up and uh, we'll get that going. Uh, I'll have to apologize in advance for sort of a lot of scrolling. I wanted to make the screen nice and large so you could see it, but that just means I'm going to have to do a lot of scrolling. So when you're in the store and you're ordering your radios, you're usually starting off with the radios first and then antennas, and then you get to the license key section. And when you get to the license key section, you know, you can see that with these buttons up here. When you get to the license key section, a lot of my customers are confused about keying. So there were a few things that I wanted to point out. First of all, you've usually, when you started off with radios, you've already pre-filtered to the type of radio that you're working with. So let's imagine you were doing a 4200 uh, dual polarity radio. If you've been doing that with the radios, it would have already filtered out all the other kind of radios, only giving you those options, but also filter out the antennas that are not compatible and only giving you the compatible radios for the 4200. Then when you get to the licensing, it does the same thing. It basically cuts the list down to only those keys that you might be interested in. What I want to focus on today is something we call enterprise license keys. These are basically, you can consider them bundle keys. And way down here at the bottom of this license key list, you'll see this enterprise two key. This key right here basically puts all the features together that we would normally ex expect most uh, WTM 4200 customers to want. In this particular case, it's basically turning on both transmitter channels, which pretty much every WTM 4200 customer is going to want. And it's turning on 4096 adaptive modulation, which is full modulation range. And then finally, it maxes out the capacity, which is 2,500 megabits. And that 2,500 megabits number, don't, don't get confused with that. That's like the maximum capacity of the radio with maximum channel widths around the world. Here in the United States, uh, if you're doing dual channel, 80 megahertz wide, you get about a gig and a half or so. But don't, don't be worried about that. Two and a half is plenty. You can see above that level, you'll be licensed for all the capacity you wanted. Now, the prices that I'm showing here are not the prices you, you would normally see, but I'm just using that as an example. And one of the things I want to point out is if we can kind of remember this uh, $1,700 number or so, if we were to get, try to license these things independently, if we needed a gig and a half of capacity, and again, these prices aren't the prices you would see, but it's, it's a perfect representation of the kind of analysis you could do. If you had a, a gigabit, that'd be about 950. You had another 500 megabits, would be another 550. We'd be up to about 1500 for the capacity keys. And then if we needed to add the second channel, which we would need this second RFM channel, we'd add another 385. So we're up to about almost 1900 bucks right there. And then we add the adaptive modulation key, another $200. So, you know, about $2,100 if we do those a la carte. You can see down here, we put all those keys together for 1700. So you're getting a bargain, if you will, for the enterprise key. And it makes it really easy for implementation because you're ordering one key and you're downloading one key and creating one key in your key file. So it just kind of makes that whole, whole life easier. The same kind of concept exists for the 4100 radio. And we will be rolling out enterprise keys for the multiband radios and for the millimeter wave radios as well. So you're gonna see more and more of these enterprise keys show up so I'll always scroll down towards the bottom of this list for now. We may end up reorganizing them in the future, but look for the word enterprise. You'll see that and you'll have a better choice of what those look like. Now, there are some cases where you might not need full capacity or maybe you're not turning on that second channel. And in that case, you might want to do a little bit of trade off to say, would it make more sense for me to buy those features a la carte today? Or would it make more, feature, more sense for me to maybe roll them up and buy the enterprise key now? Sometimes it's a little bit of cost savings. Sometimes maybe you pay just a little bit extra, but you get everything you're ever going to need for the future. So those kinds of decisions are things you're going to face. There's one other thing I wanted to cover when I'm talking about keys, and that is uh, about XPIC. For those of you familiar with the 4200, that's a, the dual, dual polarization version. That's a radio that's capable of doing XPIC, but you don't have to buy an XPIC key for it. And you'll often, uh, our customers would get confused because they see this XPIC enable license and they go, Okay, I got to buy that. No, you don't. The 4200 has XPIC built in. It's automatic feature. You don't have to pay for it. 
The reason this key exists, if you read this carefully, is it says for two times WTM something, something, or something. This is the idea that if we're using multiple independent terminals and we want to run XPIC in between them, basically two different terminals that are on the same frequency that need to have XPIC coordination between them. If that's the case, then those terminals need to have this XPIC key in order to coordinate that XPIC relationship. They also need a couple of cables. We'll, you know, we'll cover that in a different topic. But that key is where that, that particular function comes in. So that's really all I want to cover today. We'll probably get more into keying uh, later. There's other, other features in here, and you can always read around and ask us questions about what they are, whether or not you need them or not. But for now, I just thought I'd cover this enterprise key concept and talk about XPIC keying, give you an idea what that what that looks like. So hopefully that's helpful for you. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Yeah, super helpful understanding how that works. So definitely if you're buying our radios, that enterprise key is probably the bundle you're going to want to get. Save yourself some money and also much easier to install just a single license file to download rather than the individual ones. All right. So I've got a topic I'm going to cover here called um, fade margin. So I'm going to toggle over to my computer screen and thing under radio configuration. So I'll go ahead and scroll down a bit. And we're gonna get down to this fade margin setting. And you'll notice under transmit power, we have a number of things we can do. When we're running under ATPC, automatic transmit power control, the radio is gonna automatically adjust its power based on modulation and some other um, factors in the radio. What we have control over here is this value called fade margin. Now, the default uh, from the factory is gonna be 10 dB. And that's good as a default, but what this is used for is this is the value that the radio uses to increase or decrease the transmit power. And what this is saying is that on my far end radio, I'm trying to, if I have a set for 10 dB, I want to maintain always at least 10 dB of fade margin. So the radio on the far end knows where the receive level is coming in, it knows where its receiver threshold is, and it's giving feedback to its far end radio saying, hey, you need to uh, boost your power or lower it, um, either above or below my target. So by having it at 10 dB, that means that if we're going through a fade, uh, atmospheric fade, the uh, radio will start boosting its power, boosting its power, but at some point, we're gonna run out of uh, transmit power on the radio. There's only uh, a maximum amount we can transmit. And at that point, if the path continues to fade, we're gonna fall below the 10 dB, and up in the corner here, you're gonna get an alarm. So one of the alarms may be that we reached our maximum transmit power. So for paths that are, are long, and I mean long like maybe 10 plus miles, 10 to the 20 mile range or even further, uh, what we found is turning this fade margin down will be helpful in not getting so many alarms that you're, you can no longer, or you've exceeded your maximum transmit power or no longer maintaining our 10 dB. And that's okay if you remember these links will run error free down to as long as you're above receiver threshold uh, it's going to transmit error free it's only when you fall below that that you start getting errors so even with one dbfa margin while not ideal we're going to transmit error free so suggestion is if you got a long path it's okay to turn that down to maybe 5 db and maybe a really long path even 3 db so it's going to be your choice um, Ken, you got any other things about the RF uh, fade margin setting? Yeah, Jim, great topic. Uh, when I first saw this feature, I wasn't exactly sure what it what it was or what it did. But there is an added thing thing to this. So the, the first thing that Jim mentioned about the alarms is one thing, and that's kind of just more of a little bit of a hassle, that you're going to see that alarm a lot if you've got that number hit high and you're, if you're on a dynamic path, you're going to see a lot of alarms. There's something that might be more important to other customers, and that has to do with power consumption of the radio. Automatic transmit power control in the WTM radio, actually power consumption of the radio gets reduced as the transmit power is reduced. So it's probably beneficial for you to be running at minimum transmit power at all times, but to be achieving the best performance out of the radio at all times. So ATPC accomplishes that. And as you can see by this fade margin setting, ATPC basically sets the target for where that transmitter power ends up spending most of its time. So the lower the value of fade margin, the lower total power consumption you'll have over time it can save you money. Um, certainly if you're running on solar or you're running on backup generator, that kind of thing can save you, you know, save you some considerable hassle. So keeping that number low can be helpful. Now there is a bit of a warning and, and I haven't really uh, been able to spend much time with this with in, the, in the field, and that is like, what happens if you set that to 1 dB? What's wrong with setting it for 1 dB? The problem with 1 dB is if you're 1 dB above threshold and your path fades very rapidly, the timing of ATPC might not be rapid enough to adjust transmit power quickly enough 
to keep it above the threshold. So you might end up dropping modulation, dropping a little bit of capacity and then coming back up again, maybe within a second or so, but you're gonna get a lot of that. And that's kind of the chatter that we generally wouldn't want to see on most of our interfaces. So I think you want that value writing uh, at a comfortable level above it so that you're not seeing constant downshifts and upshifts uh, due, due to basically writing the noise. Yeah. And I kind of like the 3dB number for that. Of course, if you're in a power starved area, that kind of thing, you know, and you're really trying to eke out the, the last little bit of milliamp hours, you know, maybe try 2dB, maybe try one. But don't say you weren't warned about the, the fact that that could have a little bit of an impact on sort of the chattering of the speed of the interface and the capacity that you're getting over the radio. Right. Yeah, good point. So, yeah, two things, the power consumption uh, aspect of it and the alarming. So, great stuff. Thanks for sharing that, Ken. Sure thing. Okay, well, uh, that's it for this edition of Shop Talk. Thanks for joining us again, and we'll see you on the next edition. Take care, right. everybody.